Welcome back. I'm Max Bergman, director of the Stuart Center and Europe-Russia Eurasia program at CSIS. And I'm Maria Snigovaya, senior fellow for Russia and Eurasia. And you're listening to Russian Roulette, a podcast discussing all things Russia and Eurasia from the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Russian Roulette. Today, Marie and I are joined by two fantastic colleagues who will loop us in on all the most important battlefield innovations taking place in the Russian and Ukrainian militaries today. We're thrilled to have two of our close colleagues on the call, Sam Bendit and Paul Schwartz. Sam and Paul are both senior associate non-resident fellows with our program here at CSIS and also work together at the Russia Studies Program at the Center for Naval Analysis. Both Sam and Paul are experts on the Russian military and have been closely monitoring battlefield developments on the ground in Ukraine since the launch of Russia's full-scale invasion over two years ago. Paul and Sam, thank you both so much for being here today. Now, let's just jump into the into the conversation. Sam, let me maybe start with you. What, in your view, are the most important battlefield technological innovations that you have been following? And I'll ask you the same question, Paul. You, Sam, you're a, a close follower of all things drones. There was a lot of talk when the war started of the Turkish-made Bayraktar drones. How is the drone war evolving, and and what's the current state of play? Thanks for having me on the podcast, and uh, great to be joined by Paul and everybody else here. I think the biggest evolution we've seen over the two years has been a move away from the few and expensive and slow-flying system systems towards uh, mass, cheap, attributable systems. So we move away from the likes of Bayraktar and on the Russian side, for example, the Orion and the Fort Post, which were touted as combat solutions prior to the invasion. Now we're moving towards tens of thousands of FPV drones, thousands of quadcopters, hundreds of very cheap long-range UAVs. And of course, that includes loading munitions. The rapid evolution of loading munitions, both on the Russian and the Ukrainian side, has been one of the biggest surprises in this war. And so Russia uses Iranian-provided technology, Ukraine uses domestic technology. Both sides are capable of launching cheap, attributable one-way drones into each other's territories to target key military and civilian infrastructure. But the key underlying assumption for all of these drones is that they're relatively cheap, they're relatively easy to put together. And another significant evolution has been the acquisition of and use of commercial technologies alongside with oftentimes overlapping and sometimes replacing military-grade technologies. And so a lot of drones used in the war on both sides are actually made from commercial components. And of course, that doesn't negate the use of military UAVs in um, any way, shape, and form, but it complements the existing military solutions with uh, lots and lots of cheap commercial technologies, which are now used by both sides in very significant numbers. Paul, o- over to you. I'm curious, are drones the things that you would focus on as, as where you're seeing the, the technological innovations? What has surprised you or where do you see the state of play on the technological side? I actually agree very much that drones have come into their own in this conflict and have been making a profound change on the battlefield. And the, the emergence of large scale operations using loitering munitions and one-way strike drones and ISR has uh, fundamentally changed the battlefield, resulting in near ubiquitous surveillance, although that can be overstated at times. Very precise strike capabilities that has caused the ground forces to have to disperse their operations. It has greatly impeded the ability to conduct maneuver. And I think that is probably the, the chief story of the war. There are other innovations, though, that we are seeing. Uh, Electronic warfare has likewise come into its own during this conflict. Maybe not in the way that some have projected, given Russia's longstanding history with electronic warfare going back to the Soviet area and radio electronic battle. Uh, But Russian uh, EW systems have been effective at jamming and spoofing communications, disrupting navigation signals, which has impeded targeting and also uh, made it difficult for 
the Ukrainian forces, for example, to navigate their drones, sometimes losing control. I'm sure Sam can go into much greater detail on that. In addition, though, we've seen other innovations, which are maybe a couple I'd like to focus on. And it's not so much necessarily that a particular technology has emerged, although in some cases it has. Air defense has really played a profound effect in this war, unanticipated to some degree when the war started. Both sides feel large scale, very effective air defense networks, which has basically resulted in a mutual air denial for crude tactical aircraft, combat aircraft. Uh, neither side is capable of any sustained or persistent air operations over the other side's battle space or even into, into their strategic and operational territories at, op at strategic and operational depth. They're highly mobile and survivable, integrated, and especially lethal. So in the case of Russia, they effective, the Ukrainian air defense system has effectively sidelined the world's third largest air force from conducting penetrating strikes, although they still play a role in the close air support domain. I mentioned also missile defense has been surprisingly effective on the Ukrainian side, less so on the Russian. The use of Patriot, Nasons, and other enablers and systems have been able to intercept Russian long-range cruise missiles and long-range strike to a greater degree than had been initially thought. And that could have, where that's going to go ha, is yet to be seen, but that could have a profound effect on the future of warfare. The Russians, for example, rely on their precision strike as a way to manage escalation by delivering tailored results. But if they can't do that because they can't count on their missiles getting through or or achieving the kinds of results uh, that they they want, then, then they're going to have to rethink that strategy. On the other hand, some of the Western missiles that Ukraine has received, the Storm Shadow, have been highly effective at striking deep targets in both the Russian ground as well as in Crimea, affecting the, the maritime campaign. I'll stop there. All right, Maria, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Some observers have described this war as uh, essentially First World War with drones. I was just wondering if other participants would agree with this description. Sam, what do you think? Is that indeed a First World War type of warfare, but drones the only difference, primarily the major difference? Well, certainly if we look at the the way that the combat has shaped out, if we look at the existing stalemate and the reliance on both sides on trench warfare, then yes, this level of trench warfare hasn't been seen in many, many decades. But the obvious distinction with previous wars have also been the ubiquitous ISR capability, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance enabled by drones, as well as combat drone capability such as FPV drones and quadcopter drones that can now target individual units, individual soldiers, and any location along the front, especially at the very tactical level. So again, on some level, that, that description can be accurate. Paul, I was just curious, do you agree with that too? So I, I do think that in some ways the conflict has reverted in character to some of the things that we saw in World War I. But surprisingly, it's not caused by the same things that led to that stalemate in World War I. In this case, it's caused by the neutralization of certain tactics and capabilities that allowed the modern militaries to break out of the stalemate of World War I, especially seen in World War II and since conflicts since then. For one, air power, which we just talked about, has been a uh, decisive factor in a uh, enabling maneuver warfare since World War II by providing close air support, interdiction, long-range bombing to attrit military targets, command and control, etc. And once that's been denied, then the ability to bring that to bear to help to enable maneuver has, has resulted as well. In a similar vein, the proliferation of anti-tank weapons and exquisite targeting and very rapid targeting cycles from the time of target is found to when it's struck has largely uh, neutralized the ability of maneuver warfare to be undertaken to the degree it has been in past wars, even up to the U.S. invasion of Ukraine in 2003. 
And so because those two principal elements of maneuver warfare have been neutralized, we have seen that there's a tendency of conflicts to revert back to the more protracted kinds of wars of attrition we're seeing in Ukraine as well, with uh, distinct differences, of course, the proliferation of drones that has in some ways taken over the role of an air force, providing close air support. And of course, this is Sam's area, so he can go into much more greater detail than I on that. But it has allowed uh, loitering munitions and ISR and penetrating strike to some degree to, to be undertaken in the battle space. One-way attack drones have, in some respect, a very modest respect, taken up the role of strategic bombing, supplemented by long-range strike missiles and the like. But, but you're seeing then the, the re-emergence of the dominance of artillery, the ability of defense and depth to impede offensive operations using combined arms warfare on a defensive layer has been effective whereas it has less so in the offensive domain. We've seen minefields, obstacles, artillery, and, and a lot of re- weapons being able to impede the offensive. I'll actually add one more comment to Paul's excellent description. I think there are a lot of similarities between World War I and the way the war in Ukraine has introduced new technologies. And in World War I, aircraft, tanks, and armored vehicles were used for the first time, and it took some time for all belligerents to figure out how to properly use them, how to equip these technologies with specific weapons to develop tactics, techniques, procedures, and concepts in using them. And in many ways, we're starting to see that with aerial drones, for example, especially at the tactical level. We're now seeing drone-on-drone combat, we're seeing drone catchers, we're seeing drone interceptors, drone signal repeaters, we're seeing different levels of kamikaze drones, going at different distances, we're experimenting with different drone designs. The same is visible on a much smaller level, but also in a similar fashion with unmanned ground vehicles, especially at the tactical level, especially coming from soldiers themselves and the volunteers who are also kind of iterating these solutions on the fly right there on the front lines. And so some of the older tactics are not applicable. Some of the older tactics with these technologies are in fact applicable, but there's a lot of experimentation and this technological race that is taking place, which is reminiscent of how old belligerents tried to adopt these new technologies back in World War I. I want to say that this reminds me of retrofuturism, you know, this tendency to apply, reconsider the past, and history seems to be going in circles, and we, when we come back to essentially some, in, in the new spiral to back where we were back in the days. Just a quick follow-up on that. I also have heard comments that the drones and this extreme visibility of the front line that I think Paul also pointed out make the shifting front line extremely hard. So it doesn't mean that we essentially are stuck in these positions now that each side is so extremely visible to each other. And to what extent do you think this description is correct altogether? Well, certainly, if we look at the comments made by the Ukrainian defense leadership, there's a lot of concern about the stalemate and the need for new technologies to break out of the stalemate. One avenue to pursue, for example, articulated by General Zaluzhny when he was the defense minister, is to use a greater share of unmanned systems, aerial systems, ground systems, to use electronic warfare and other technologies to negate the other side's defenses. And so the side that is able to come up with a breakthrough solution and scale it very quickly and then apply it in a breakthrough is the one that actually wins. But we're also facing a Russian tactic where soldiers are used again, on a scale not seen since World War I and World War II, and Russian military is able to absorb absolutely staggering amount of casualties. This is something that probably wasn't anticipated before. And so if Russia can waste tens of thousands of people trying to take each small village at a time, they can, in fact, grind their way through West, which is what's slowly happening right now at the front. That's why there's a lot of concern in Ukraine for not just Western weapons, but specific types of weapons that can strike deep, that can strike en masse. And that, of course, involves different types of unmanned and uncrewed systems uh, that can take Ukrainian soldiers out of dangerous situations without necessarily affecting the quality of the Ukrainian combat. I can add to that if I might. So I think also 
it's it's hard to draw firm lessons from the Ukraine war about the uh, potential uh, evolution of maneuver warfare going forward and whether future warfares are going to be more characteristic of this one or or whether this is a an anomaly based on the circumstances. There's some things to think about though. One is that even though both Ukraine and Russia have struggled to overcome the air defense systems of the other side in an advanced war involving the U.S., for example, the U.S. still has cards to play that these two countries do not. One of those is a very well-developed, what they call a SEED capability, S-E-A-D, Suppression of Enemy Air Defense. And the U.S. has used those to great effect in previous wars in Iraq, in uh, Libya, and, and other places. And these allow the, the ability to, to draw out air defense, to to strike them with high-speed anti-radiation missiles and ultimately either destroy them or suppress them to force them to be so conscious of their vulnerability that they they don't operate, which then has enabled air operations to continue. The other card that U.S. holds, of course, is a large fleet of penetrating stealth combat aircraft, tactical attack and strike aircraft. And Neither of the, although Russia has some rudimentary stealth capability, it hasn't been sufficiently developed to be able to counter air defense. By the same token, maneuver warfare, part of the challenge, we have seen both sides conduct effective maneuver warfare at times. The Russians early on, especially in the South, Ukraine at Kharkiv, which was in, to some extent enabled by their local military superiority in numbers and equipment. The Russians still have a, a well-developed capability. They're, one of their challenges is they've lost a significant amount of armor, but even more so the, the quality combat troops that it takes with the training and, and leadership and tactical understanding to carry out effective combined arms warfare, which is one of the most challenging tasks for any ground force. And so it's it's a little diff to it's a little premature to read into this that it's solely due to evolving technological systems and capabilities on the battlefield. No, thank, thanks for that, Paul. I mean, it, the war definitely strikes me as both kind of this Mad Max future, but then also you know elements of uh, strong elements of the past with the especially with the use of mines and other in, entrenchment systems. But I want to maybe talk about the naval dimension a bit, because this is where Ukraine, I think, has had st stunning success in essentially neutralizing Russia's naval capabilities, which Ukraine basically doesn't have a navy and is, has been able yet to push the Russian naval fleet way back from its waters and has, in fact, opened up uh, now a shipping corridor that has enabled Ukraine to export more grain than it did under the grain initiative where Russia sort of agreed not to attack Ukrainian vessels. So I, I'm curious how you see the naval dimension and what are the kind of broader implications here? I'm thinking of Taiwan in, in particular, where the ability to neutralize a uh, far superior adversary at sea seems to be really applicable. Sam, you want me to take the first crack at that? Okay. So, yes, this has been one of the most striking developments in the, in the conflict. Whereas the, on the ground front, things have largely stalemated as you pointed out on the naval domain and the maritime domain, Ukraine has been making significant strides. And what they have been able to do primarily is since, as you noted, they have a very, almost a virtually no Navy, a small mosquito fleet remnant capability, is that they've been able to use ground-based systems to counter Russia's fairly well-developed Black Sea Fleet, it's uh, surface forces, essentially. And we saw this early on with the use of ground-based CDCMs, Coastal Defense Cruise Missiles, uh, using the Neptune missile, a uh, indigenously developed system that the Ukrainians came up with, supplemented by some Western systems, that were able to hold Russian surface ships at risk in the waters reasonably closer to the Ukrainian coastal areas in the Northern Black Sea. 
And that was exemplified most uh, stunningly by the sinking of the Moss Bomb in April 2022. And so by virtue of that, that was able to create a sea denial zone, which was off limits to Russian warships uh, for the most part because of the risk of uh, these cruise missiles. But Russia was still free to operate further out into the Black Sea for much of the war. What we've seen more recently is that Ukraine has been fielding additional systems to help extend their reach uncrewed surface vehicles, small attack boats uncrewed with high payloads that have the ability to go further and further from the Ukrainian coast to strike Russian warships at sea and even in ports, supplemented by uh, surface-to-surface -surface missiles, land, mainly land attack missiles used to strike targets in Crimea, ports, the Navy headquarters, ships in port, for example, and collectively, these two things have uh, served to further constrain Russia's naval ability to operate in the Black Sea, forcing them increasingly into the eastern parts of the, the Black Sea region. That, in turn, has countered Russia's ability to use its naval power to support the ground war and to blockade the coast more as effectively as they did during the earlier stages of the war. So it has been an interesting development. I'll just add that it has significant impl implications, both pro and con. One way to think about it is in, as you mentioned, Taiwan. It, it could serve as an example of how a country like Taiwan could use these kinds of asymmetric land-based systems to counter a potential PRC invasion if that were attempted down the road. Quite different scenarios. You'd have to look at a lot at the specifics of the force matchups there. On the other hand, it's sort of vindicated uh, A to AD thinking, which is which of course has been developed primarily with an eye on U.S. Uh, power projection capabilities. U.S. being largely an expeditionary military in many respects, and so we we ourselves have to consider the implications for our operational, our freedom to operate as well. And Sam, over to you. And also just for clarification, A2 AD anti-area denial for all our non-military experts. I tend to agree with Paul. I think one of the more interesting developments so far has been the fact that Ukraine is now pushing Russia to spend a lot of resources trying to defend its Black Sea fleet. Basically, this is a completely asymmetrical response to what it should be considered one of the more powerful navies in the world. And so Russia is now trying to scramble with solutions, trying to install machine guns on ships, to have a day and night watch on their vessels, to have some kind of radars to fly ISR drones or even FPV drones for surveillance around the ships. But this is highly uneven. It doesn't get... I, these directives aren't pushed down to every single vessel. Obviously, some parts of the Russian Black Sea Fleet are better protected and have better tactics against some of these USV drones than other ships. Russian vessels are often caught unawares, which shows the difficulty of trying to counter this type of technology, especially if Ukrainian USVs are attacking at night. Russian media likes to sort of have this tongue-in-cheek approach to the entire concept by saying that Ukrainians and the Russians are ahead of the entire world in trying to defend or adopt this technology. Ukrainians are the ones who are fielding it, and Russians are the ones who are trying to defend against it in an active war. But right now, again, the onus is on the Russian military to defend its fleet, to expend a lot of resources, to put a lot of efforts in trying to identify and destroy the Ukrainian USVs, but it's not always effective. Again, the, the Russian tactics are applied unevenly, and it's not even clear if they're going to be widespread across other fleets as well. It strikes me that one of the main challenges here is simply production. We have seen Russia uh, have an ability to ramp up its defense industrial production. We all have a, a report coming out soon looking at Russia's defense industrial sector. The first edition of this report came out last year. It was called Out of Stock. The second edition coming out soon is called Back in Stock. 
But it, it seems to me on the technological side, particularly drones, that Russia is sort of outsourcing production, essentially buying from China. And I'm curious, what's the, the situation on, on Ukraine side? Uh, we're seeing Ukraine strike Russian oil refineries, but that's from domestically made drones. This flooding of the battle space with, with, with cheap drones and, and Ukraine developing drones at sea, it, how much of this is indigenous on the part of both Russia and Ukraine? How much of this needs to be scaled up even further? What are kind of some of the challenges for production? We'll go to you first, Sam, and then over to you, Paul. Well, there are significant challenges in trying to restart the domestic production for a lot of the components and parts that go into manufacturing drones. There's a lot of challenges in Russia and in Ukraine in trying to have this import substitution. There's a lot of reliance on China, and it's undeniable, certainly for FPV-type drones, for a lot of a lot of commercial drones, the dependence is almost absolute on the Russian side. And the Ukrainians are also complaining that they too have to depend on Chinese suppliers. There are a lot of efforts, again, trying to jumpstart this production domestically. Ukrainians are talking about purchasing certain components in Western Europe, in friendly countries. But for many drone types, the dependence on China is going to be relatively long term. What has also happened is that a lot of long-range drones used by Ukraine, as well as used by Russia, feature a lot of commercial components as well, namely from the West. And there are a lot of good reports which actually identify a lot of American components in many drones, for example, used by Russia. Ukraine is also using commercial components because they're widespread, they're readily available. They can't really be interdicted or blocked by any specific sanctions. Again, these are readily available commercial components and they can be purchased worldwide. Ukraine has a lot of different types of long-range one-way attack drones, from more sophisticated ones to the ones used more recently, where it's essentially just a plumbing pipe uh, with an engine and a few wings. Uh, obviously, commercial communications and, and, and camera technology installed. Ukraine also depends on Western commercial partners like Starlink for a lot of communications for its long-range drone applications, both for aerial drones and for unmanned surface vessels. So uh, again, it's a difficult climb for both countries. And the role of China in this war, a country that's actually not fighting directly in combat, is almost absolute for a lot of drone types. And this is of concern to Ukraine. Of course, it is of concern to Russia also. And both sides are trying to jumpstart some sort of domestic production to lessen this dependence. So. Totally agree with Sam. We've seen Russia making efforts towards ramping up their production of drones to, with some success, still dependent, as Sam noted, on supply chains, uh, external supply chains for a variety of components and parts, especially China. But we've also seen production and mobilization play a very important role in this war more generally. Neither side really anticipated, especially Russia, I should say, anticipate being embroiled in a protracted war of attrition like it has been, which has forced it to, to, to deplete enormous amounts of arms and equipment. And Russia has had to scramble to ramp up its production. Shortages of military equipment played an important role in the campaign in many areas. Long-range strike using its best frontline precision strike weapons was significantly impeded as well, and I should have mentioned this earlier, by simply lack of scale, lack of ability to, to sustain operations and strike uh, Ukrainian targets persistently and repeatedly at enough scale to, to achieve greater operational strategic effects because frankly, Russia's production capacity has been unable to produce these weapons at, at sufficient pace to allow for that to happen. At the same time, uh, the ability to, pr to produce tanks, artillery, tubed artillery, and, and many other systems at a scale needed to replenish depleted stocks has, has been problematic. Ammunition, a shell hunger that emerged in uh, the late fall, early winter of 2022-2023, uh, had a profound effect on the war, forcing Russia to scale back its use of artillery at precisely the same time when the Ukrainians using high Mars precision artillery were disrupting their logistics supply chain and ammunition dumps. 
it actually resulted in a shift, a more balanced fire superiority balance during that period of the war, which has recently reverted back to Russia's favor because now Ukraine is suffering from stockpile problems due in part to delays in Western military assistance. And so we have seen throughout this war the importance of being of both sides of being able to conduct a protracted war to mobilize their industry and to mobilize their forces to sustain combat operations over such a prolonged period. And I think that is causing a lot of rethinking in militaries around the world. Thank you very much, Sam and Paul. So precisely on that last note, could you perhaps comment about the future of warfare? We see that AI and all these new sophisticated technologies really seem to be radically reshaping the battlefield. So could you perhaps, can we imagine what it's going to look like going forward? And most importantly, what are the main important lessons that the West should uh, draw looking at this war going forward? Sam? Well, one of the major lessons from the war in Ukraine is the availability of lots and lots of heterogeneous data. So data coming from different sources, different quality, in different amounts, in different quantities, and the need to go through the data to identify specific targets, to identify specific resources. This is where artificial intelligence is allegedly already helping Ukraine, and they're using different types of artificial intelligence and machine learning applications provided both by Western American partners as well as developed domestically. We have to assume that given all the resources that Russia spend on trying to develop AI prior to the war, they're probably doing something similar. So in many ways, artificial intelligence is not leaving the battlefield anymore. It's here to stay. Artificial intelligence that would enable drones to fly in swarms in more sophisticated operations is also something that's very high on the agenda both for Ukraine and Russia. There are a lot of uh, hints that there are testing and developments taking place for AI and machine learning enabled drones. We haven't seen them in combat yet, but it is likely that we may. Swarming applications is something that both sides have announced as one of their priorities given so many different types of drones in the air. And given such powerful electronic warfare and air defense countermeasures, so enabling some types of drones with artificial intelligence to go beyond that would be extremely important and very, very helpful for for Ukraine specifically. And again, United States military, other world militaries are looking at Ukraine as this battle tech lab, a term that has been used before already. And so these are some of the lessons that would be learned by major militaries from Ukraine, how to analyze data, how to transmit data, how to use different types of data, and how to enable some of the technologies already operational to act more independently in a much more lethal fashion. So I can add, um, I see AI helping in various applications going forward. Some of us starting to see in Ukraine, some are likely further down the road. The ability to compress the decision loop from the time of finding a target to bringing a strike against that target is likely to continue to be compressed as autonomous processing of all of this targeting data, rapid communication to different points of fire, and then bringing precision weaponry to bear to on these, these targets. We've already seen some emergence of this in Ukraine with a precision artillery on both sides, the HIMARS capability against Russian munitions, dumps, and logistics nodes, and Russia, for its part, continue to perfect its reconnaissance fires networks. Um, But I see that continuing. To use this for fleeting data to to strike targets that that are moving by drawing a variety of sensors, information from various sensors together to inform command and control to to strike things like mobile air defenses, perhaps even stealth combat aircraft in the future. That's something that's likely to continue to emerge uh, as AI gets built out. One thing to consider is the U.S. and its allies have taken some measures recently to try to prevent the spread of some of the most advanced AI technologies to both Russia and China, Russia under heavy sanctions, and China under targeted sanctions targeting AI prevention of very advanced AI chips, 
manufacturing technology. Remains to be seen whether that will be effective, but right now the West is taking measures to maintain their lead in AI. Maybe I could turn to take it a bit more to the practical when looking ahead. I mean, both are everything you said is practical, but uh, in terms of the nuts and bolts of uh, of the potential for success, both from where Russia is right now trying to go on the offensive, and then hopefully the Congress will pass funding, Ukraine will be rearmed, and potentially be able to uh, both hold off the Russian offensive, but maybe go on another counteroffensive in in twenty twenty five. Now. What is the prospect for offensive maneuver warfare if you can't really bring air power to bear, which seems like hopefully Ukraine can continue to to deny that somewhat to to Russia? And is there any prospect of breakthroughs on on either side? Because it seems like what we're seeing, at least on the Russian case, well, Russian mass is beginning to have an effect, particularly as as Ukraine is being attrited both by Russia's offensive and by the attrition of Western resupply. World War One, in some ways, is used as sort of this crutch to say, well, the war's in a stalemate. But of course, World War One ended with the German army, at least on the Western front, eventually being rather attrited and then allied armies going on the offensive. So curious how you see the prospects of offensive operations going forward. Maybe we'll start with with you, Paul, and then Sam. Okay, so in a war of attrition that we have seen emerge, it's not necessarily predestined that this is going to be the the situation going forward. Uh, We have seen effective maneuver in various points throughout the war especially Kharkiv, when uh, Ukraine was able to conduct an effective counteroffensive against Russia, despite lacking air control. So it can be facilitated, and was as it was facilitated in that case, by an imbalance that emerges on the battlefield. In that case, Russia had yet to call for its partial mobilization. They had depleted their forces considerably, and Ukraine was able to take advantage of the numerical superiority using some deception, by the way, that led Russia to shift some of its forces towards Kherson just before the Kharkiv offensive was launched. That's a little less viable at this point because Russia has mobilized and they continue to mobilize. And even though it's a struggle for them to sustain the flow of tr- combat troops to the front, they have found ways both through the partial mobilization in September of 2022 and ongoing recruiting efforts to sustain enough force that we have not seen this kind of imbalance arise. Now, Ukraine was empowered with a lot of Western military equipment and training prior to its summer 2023 counteroffensive, uh, but it was not able to break the stalemate. It, it was it did not prove sufficient because Russia was effectively able to counter it with deeply entrenched defense in depth. My own view is it will take Substantial shift over time in one side or the other's forces being significantly degraded to allow for the kind of imbalance that would uh, would enable a resumption of maneuver warfare operations. I think it's difficult for us to assume exactly what kind of specific tactic or technology will lead to a breakthrough. Again, Ukrainian defense ministry is, in fact, very concerned about the ongoing stalemate and the need for uh, new tactics and new technologies. Of course, developing tactics and technologies takes time. And Ukraine is signaling to the Western partners that it needs available equipment, available military systems, simply because Russia is massing its forces and intends to, again, continue its advance, probably no matter the cost. And this is something that has to be considered. How many losses is Russia able to sustain in this war? to achieve its objectives and whether or not there will be any effect on Russia as a country or society as a result. And so we have to take all of those matters into consideration. I think we also have to highlight the fact that it's been a long time since military strategists or analysts and researchers have talked about a stalemate between conventional powers, probably not since, again, World War I at some point and at some point since World War II. So it's been many, many decades since we actually applied 
this level of thinking to a mass scale stalemate between such powerful militaries. And the fact that we haven't necessarily considered that as one of the options is probably indicative of, of where this war ended up right now, with both sides fielding similar technologies, both sides fielding similar tactics, both sides saturating the airspace with ubiquitous and ever-present drones for intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. So I, I don't have an easy answer here. It isn't necessarily known exactly what would lead to a breakthrough, but time is of the essence right now, and I think Ukraine is signaling that very clearly. Well, thank you very much, Paul and Sam. I think it was a fascinating, extremely important and timely uh, discussion. I hope that people who are making decisions <laughs> about supply and Ukraine aid are listening to this conversation. And uh, unfortunately, we'll have to end it there, given the time constraints. Let's to thank you, Sam and Paul, for joining us today. And of course, as usual, thank you to our listeners for tuning in. Here's our regular reminder that to please subscribe to our podcast if you haven't already, and also give us a five-star rating. We really appreciate those. Additionally, be sure to check out our sister podcast, The Eurofile, wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time. You've been listening to Russian Roulette. We hope you enjoyed this episode and tune in again soon. Russian Roulette releases new episodes every two weeks on Thursdays and is available wherever you get your podcasts. So please subscribe and share our episodes online. And be sure to check out all the latest analysis by the Europe, Russia and Eurasia program at csis.org.